Hey, howdy everyone. This is Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas. And this lecture that we're going to cover right now continues our discussion around feature projection for the purpose of dimensionality reduction. And so let's go ahead and talk about what I think personally is a really interesting alternative beyond principal component analysis that we covered last time, which is multidimensional scaling. So we're going to cover multidimensional scaling, give an example, and I'll include another lecture afterwards on the concept of random projection. So what's the motivation? Why do we want to cover multidimensional scaling? Well, just like all of the other discussion around feature selection and feature projection, we're concerned about the fact that we're forced to, in modern problems, to work with highly multivariate, high dimensional data sets. And that's challenging. We've already talked about the cursed dimensionality, multicollinearity, and all kinds of other subjects around that. So we want to use projection to a lower dimension so we can improve the stability of our models, that we can improve the interpretability of our models. And we want to do this with multidimensional scaling while preserving dissimilarity between our samples. So let's go ahead and get into multidimensional scaling. A great way to get started is to look at this example right here. Now notice the link below. I took this from that website, example and figures from the website. I am appreciative for that. So let's say we have a list of cities in the US. Boston, Chicago, DC, Denver, LA, Miami, and so forth. We have many cities. And all you have is the pairwise distances between each of the cities and themselves. So we would have a matrix that would look like this, Boston, Chicago, DC, Denver, all the way up to San Francisco. And on this axis, we would have repeat the same sequence and we would expect the diagonal to have zeros. We're talking about the distances between the cities and themselves. And so this was the only piece of information that we had available to us. The question is, could we then project these cities into some space such that we preserve the pairwise distances? And if we went ahead and did that, this is what we would get, or this would be one possible solution. And so you can see Miami, DC, New York, Boston, Chicago, Denver. And so this would be a projection into a two-dimensional space using the measure of distance that was provided in that distance matrix. Now, of course, we could look at that solution and say, well, is that correct? Given the way we understand the position of the cities within our country, we might not be familiar with that projection. We might look at that and say, hmm, that looks like an upside down perspective. Maybe that's the Australian map. As far as I've seen Australian maps where they flip the map upside down, put Australia on the top. But you could imagine that this may not be familiar to us. But if you were to go through and calculate the pairwise distances between all of the cities, you would find that you were in fact doing a great job, probably preserving them. Now we could of course go ahead and just rotate this solution and we would get to something that of course would be more familiar to us. Now what have we accomplished here? We moved from original features for which we only had the pairwise distance matrix and we provided a brand new projection of the features such that we honored these distances. And so how can we use this methodology in dimensionality reduction? and in general for data analytics with problems, subsurface problems. Well, let's consider, let's kind of expand this and consider the idea of using any type of dissimilarity measure. For instance, if we look at this work right here, I recognize the fact that um, my good friend, Professor Karis Stanford has, of course, worked on this topic and a variety of different um, co-authors from the standpoint of representing geostatistical models and their dissimilarity with each other for the purpose of subsurface assessments and modeling. And so we could consider a wide range of different differences. Maybe in, in this case, instead of cities, we're talking about individual models or representations of the subsurface that may have come from a wide variety of different types of geostatistical methods, variogram based, object based, and multiple point based. And then what we could do is we could come up with a a metric, a measure, as I'll define metric later, but a measure of dissimilarity. And so what could that be? It could be something based on the global distribution, proportions of sand, maybe something to do with spatial continuity, some difference between the models based on global parameters for the model. 
Maybe it might also be something more local, local distributions, local measures. Maybe you're concerned about local effects within the model. And it could even be a summarization based on feature extraction. In this paper, I believe they use some type of measure of clusters, clusters of different types of architecture, and then maybe counting or some quantification of that clustering. Flow behavior, we could run flow simulation, get recovery factor, and do a comparison between differences in flow behavior. And you could even consider pixel-to-pixel -pixel comparisons where we go through and compare models based on some difference, this pixel to this pixel, this pixel to this pixel, and get an overall summarization of the change between the images, very specific to the locations within the image, if I may say so. What results? is we can take this measure of dissimilarity, build a dissimilarity matrix, and then project our models into this space right here. What's fascinating is we can now visualize what is fundamentally a high dimensional data set, these models with all of the many pixels, with the binary, perhaps sand shale assignments to those pixels into this lower dimensional space. And we can now compare these models to each other. We can visualize them. It's a very powerful, methodology for information visualization. And that's what we gain with MDS. It is quite common for people to try to project down to, say, two dimensions so we can readily visualize the problem. Okay, we've kind of given some, like a very general idea or a example of going from cities to projection in space. And we've talked now about the idea of dissimilarity and using a wide range of different dissimilar metrics. Okay, so let's go ahead and refine things down. First of all, what is the metric that we're trying to impose on the model? What is the goodness measure that we're working with? With multidimensional scaling, what we're trying to do is minimize the square difference, or as I'll show later, we can generalize to other types of norms, not just L2 norm, of course, between all the training data in the projected lower dimensional space and the original feature space. And so for multidimensional scaling, we'll define a brand new statistic, we'll call it stress, and stress is calculated like this. Stress in the lower dimensional space over all of the sample data available to us is simply going to be the sum of all the pairwise combinations of the data set where we're going to compare. This right here is simply going to be the distance method metric between all of the possible pairs, and we're going to exclude any cases where we're comparing a data value with itself. So we're doing a, a double sum over the, all the possible pairs. And this metric right here is going to be the distance in the projected lower dimensional space. It's our measure. I say distance, but it really is more generally a measure of dissimilarity. Where delta is in fact the original dissimilarity metric in the original dimensional space. This is what we're trying to reproduce. This is our approximation, and we're going to try to minimize this square difference. Stress is represented with a square root so that we get it back to original units of dissimilarity like we would with a standard deviation. Now, how would we check the model visually? How would we visualize the result once we run this projection into a lower dimensional space, preserving the pairwise distances? Well, a great way to do it is you can just scatter plot. You can scatter plot the original pairwise distances between all of the pairs of samples, excluding cases where you compare training samples with themselves, and the pairwise distances in the projected space. If you have a perfect reproduction in the lower dimensional space of the pairwise distances, you would expect all of these points to fall on the 45 degree line. And you can see this is quite good reproduction of the pairwise distances here. And you have another example, which I include in my workflow later on, for which you can see that uh, there's some deviation, there's some bias going on here. In general, there seems to be an expectation lower distance than we actually saw in the original space. This is quite possible due to the fact that we are projecting to a lower dimensional space. We, in general, will decrease pairwise distances. You would expect that to happen. Let's make some comments around the uniqueness of the MDS solution. So it's going to be based on the pairwise dissimilarity metric. And so you could imagine if you were working with a set of training data available to you in this feature space, and then in the lower dimensional projection P from this original M feature space, you can imagine that the solution is not going to be unique 
and specifically for Euclidean distance, they'll be invariant to translation or to rotation or even if you to a reflection. And so let me just comment on that. So first of all, for the purpose of tr translation, you could imagine you could take all of the values associated to a single feature and just add a constant across all of the training sample data and do that across all of the available features. The distances, the pairwise distances would not actually be changed under that translation. So what are we going to do since it's non-unique? When we project, we'll just assume that we're working with projected features that are now centered. And so this will allow us to have a, you know, an arbitrary decision as far as where to anchor the projected results. This would also apply to rotation. Scale our feature matrix by another matrix that was orthogonal. We would expect that for a Euclidean distance, that it would be invariant to this. It would represent a just a simple rotation. And we know that intuitively, if you take a system and you rotate it, the Euclidean distance between all of the samples within that space will be preserved. Now let's describe, first of all, classical M MDS, classical multidimensional scaling. Now it's a bit more limited than what we'll show next with the metrics MDS. The general idea, and this is interesting, similar to PCA, there is an eigen solution that can be applied. Now, of course, in PCA, we are working with the covariance matrix and the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that. We'll be here working with our dissimilarity, or I'll say a distance matrix. We're going to go ahead and calculate the squared distance matrix. We're going to apply a double centering where J is going to be a centering matrix, more details can be looked up as far as exactly what is the form. I'd, this is really out of scope for the purpose of this basic overview right now. Solve for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors from this matrix, squared matrix that's been double centered. And then we can go ahead and solve for the projected coordinates by applying those. Now, we should comment on the fact that in order to apply this classical MDS method, we have to work with dissimilarities that are Euclidean. And so that means that the distances can be represented as L2 norm or L2 distances, as shown here in this general equation right here, over each one of the pairs of samples i and j across features one through M that we're working with. And of course, we'll be projecting to a lower dimensional P where P is less than M. Now note there are many dissimilarities that we may want to apply that are beyond Euclidean. And so we may not want to be constrained by classical MDS. We may also want to work with other norms, not necessarily the L2 norm. And so metric MDS offers us quite a general approach, a more generalized approach than classical MDS, where we work through iterative optimization. So remember, we defined already the concept of stress, and we're using an L2 norm for that. We were simply comparing the pairwise distances across all possible pairs with the double sum, excluding cases for which we're comparing the training sample with itself, and where we have the distance metric between the pairs in the lower projected space being differenced or compared with the actual distance metric in the original space. And we can go ahead and solve this through iterative optimization to minimize this. And so this right here would be an example of solving for the case of an L2 norm. We're taking the minimization of the square difference. And this could be applied to, of course, any dissimilarity metric or measure that we could come up with. Now let's go ahead and define for the purpose of distance or dissimilarity, what, how would we define a valid metric that we could work for, work with? And so what we need is a function that provides a measure of dissimilarity between any pair of objects in space, in the feature space, such that we would say that it would be a metric, a valid metric, when it satisfies the following relationships. First of all, for any possible pair of samples, training samples, X and Y, we would expect the dissimilarity measure to be greater than or equal to zero. 
and that we would expect it to be equal to zero if and only if we have the case for which the sample x is equal to the training sample y. We would expect it to also honor the relationship that the comparison of x and y, x and y, is equal to the comparison or the dissimilarity between y and x. It would make no sense for it not to have that symmetry. And then finally, this is an interesting thing. The idea would be the dissimilarity between x and z samples must be less than or equal to the dissimilarity between x and y plus the dissimilarity between y and z. And if you think about this geometrically, that's the idea that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And if I pick any other point at any other location and try to make a comparison between this point to that point and then to this point, that that should not, cannot be less than the distance from straight line. Okay, so that would be the analogy to understand that concept geometrically. But if we honor these, then we can say that we have a valid metric that's describing dissimilarity between our samples. Now, let's just put everything in context now by reflecting back at multidimensional scaling and comparing it specifically to other forms of dimensionality reduction. First of all, multidimensional scaling is focused on preserving the pairwise measure of dissimilarity between all of the available training samples. There's no distribution assumption. Could proceed, we actually proceed with only the dissimilarity measure, not in fact the actual measures themselves, which is interesting. Now, principal component analysis, as we discussed last time, is all about maximizing the variance and set of orthogonal projections. And so it will work specifically with the covariance matrix across the features, and it will find the first through the M principal components under the constraint of mutual orthogonality between them, with the first principal component describing the very most amount of variance possible of all the training samples projected onto it, and so forth under the constraint of orthogonality going from highest amount of variance to lowest amount of variance explained. Factor analysis explains the covariance matrix while assuming multi-Gaussianity. And it works with the underlying model that we are trying to discover a lower number of unobserved features, these common factors that can describe our phenomenon. Now, let me make a general comment around comparing multidimensional scaling and principal component analysis Classic Torgerson's metric MDS worked by converting the dissimilarity measures into a similarity metric. And it performs eigen decomposition like we do with PCA of the pairwise similarity matrix. And so we could actually suggest that PCA could be deemed as a simple form of MDS. And so some suggest that PCA, in fact, could be included under the umbrella of MDS. PCA, of course, minimizes the from the principal component projections and at the same time while maximizing the variance of the projections on the principal components, but it really doesn't seek to directly preserve the pairwise distances. So from that perspective, I'm quite comfortable in suggesting it's a separate methodology because of the fundamental idea of preserving pairwise distances to me is quite a bit, it's a, it is a different approach than what we're doing in PCA. All right, so that was all that I have to say about multidimensional scaling. I have an example available on GitHub where you can go ahead and work through a basic multidimensional scaling exercise in order to project to a lower dimensional space while preserving pairwise distances. Very powerful. I will right away provide a short lecture also on the idea of random projection and when we could use it as an alternative to multidimensional scaling. All right, I hope this short lecture was helpful to you. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas on Twitter, YouTube, and GitHub. I'm the Geostats guy where I share all of my lectures, all my lecture content in the hope that it will benefit working professionals, and of course, all of my students. Um, I was just contacted by email by one of my former students who graduated last year, and let me know how much they appreciated this course content that is evergreen 
and available to them long after the course is finished. I love that idea. I think that's amazing. I have students and I will be able to retain this network and work together and build and help all of these former students as they go on and do great things. All right. Thank you very much for the email. I appreciate the positive feedback on that. And hey, everybody take care. Okay. Bye.